One of the most remarkable events in the history of the world recently occurred in the nation of Russia. For over 40 long years, the Russian bear had stretched its dark shadow across much of the earth. But today, the hammer and sickle is no more. A strange, mysterious wind of freedom is suddenly blowing in that part of the world. Marx, Lenin, and Stalin are today only bad memories. On November 9, 1989, the Berlin Wall suddenly came down. The world watched in shocked fascination as East and West Berliners chipped away the concrete and steel barrier that had kept them from loved ones, from freedom, and from the gospel. Communism was dead. Today it is possible not only to visit the nation of Russia, but to distribute Bibles, to preach the gospel on city streets and in Russian schools, even assist Russian pastors in building local churches. Suddenly, Russia wants to know God. The International Board of Jewish Missions in Chattanooga, Tennessee has dedicated itself to taking the gospel and the scriptures inside this nation that once murdered Christians. In 1949, Dr. Jacob Gardenhouse, founder of IBJM, began a ministry to Jews around the world. Dr. Gardenhouse never dreamed in those days of being able to take the gospel of Jesus Christ inside the very walls of the Kremlin. In our generation, more than any other generation, that opportunity has become reality. God has provided open doors and open hearts. Miracles in the Ukraine. Here's a copy of the Everlasting Nation. It says on the masthead, Touching Jewish Hearts Through Love. It's the magazine of the International Board of Jewish Missions in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Recently, we had the distinct privilege of meeting Henry Binnick, who gave us a tour of this marvelous facility in Chattanooga and showed us graphic pictures from the Jewish Holocaust of the Second World War. Here is a ministry reaching out to the Jewish people of the world. And now, Henry Binnick from the Ukraine. We're standing in the square right in front of the Hotel Kharkov where we've arrived on our now 10-day evangelistic journey to the Ukraine. Right behind me is a statue of Lenin. Who would have thought that just a few years after people were put in prison for their faith that we could just be here in this place giving out gospel literature. We have a group of men that are across the street preaching with a portable microphone system, sharing the gospel. We're praying that many people will come to know Christ. This is our first day in the city of Kharkov. On the way to Kharkov, we have already had some unusual experiences. In our bus, we stopped at a little rest area. We had an opportunity to publicly preach to a group of young students, young uh, boys and girls, and 14 of them made professions of faith in Christ. And then uh, we also talked to a Jewish shopkeep owner. And he uh, told us that uh, the rabbi had been there and told him, don't accept anything except the law told him that uh, this was not man's word that we were giving, but the word of God from the Bible. He said, I'll see you again. I'll talk to you. Unfortunately, the man did not accept Christ as his personal savior, and, and we have his card and hope to get back with him. Right now, there are many members of our group standing in the square, and they're giving out literature. They're giving flyers for a special meeting that we're going to be holding, and uh, also another group that is preaching in the street, and we're hoping that many people will come to know the Lord. This is our sixth time in the Ukraine, and we're hoping that uh, we'll see many, many people come to know the Lord. So far in the last 16 months, we've had over 22,000 professions of faith, and we're pr praying that the Lord will give us hundreds more during our time here. For the last three hours, we've been standing in this square here across from our hotel. We originally planned to give out flyers and tracts and materials concerning our meeting, which is going to be held at a hall that's just directly behind us. And the results have been just even more than we've even expected. We have been talking to people that have been interested in the Lord. We have a group of men standing behind us that are preaching with a portable PA system. And so far, probably about two or 300 people have already made professions of faith in the Lord. It's interesting, we're standing in the courtyard where just a few feet away is a very large statue of Lenin. Lenin is dead. Lenin's philosophy is dead. But Jesus Christ is alive today, and this is a new hope. Communism failed, but Christianity and faith in Jesus Christ has been very open. Interesting that we have talked to great numbers of Jewish people. One man came up and saw the star that we have uh, that we're wearing, all of us wearing Stars of David, and one of the preachers gave him the star, and the man was so excited, 
He said, coming to the meeting, I'm interested in knowing about Jesus Christ. I'm Jewish. I want to know more. Uh, we've had an opportunity, been asked to be interviewed on a television program with the cultural relationship between Israel and the Ukraine. And so God is helping us to accomplish the purpose that we came here for. IBJM missionary Mike King had this to say. I thank God for the privilege of being here in the new Ukraine. Uh, these people are so excited to get a hold of God's word that they are just reaching out. Some of them are wanting to take more than one track. They want to take it home and give it to the relatives. And in the United States, we certainly don't experience anything like this. Here is an amazing event seldom witnessed in America. Listen as missionary Alan Lord ministers under the shadow of Lenin's statue. Don't pray this prayer if you're not serious. If you're not ready to follow Christ, don't pray the prayer. I know that I am a sinner. And Jesus, thank you. For sending your son. For sending your son. Save me from my sins. And I trust you as my Savior. Today. Thank you, Lord, for saving me today. Not all ministry effort was conducted on the street. This Harkov theater seating 1,600 people was secured for an evening service. 2,500 people crowded into the building at service time to hear the word of God. The team was welcomed to the city by Ukrainian officials. The gospel was preached and the response was tremendous. The preaching of the Bible increased the hunger of the people for the printed scriptures. Following the service, Bibles were distributed to hundreds of anxious recipients. Though the public services were exciting, the best place to interview and reach the Ukrainian people was in the public places of the city. When asked about whether or not he acknowledged Jesus Christ, this World War II veteran expressed his answer this way. It was, uh, we, we need religions. We, we need Christ here. The, he exists up and on the heaven. This Russian woman accepted Christ. Listen as Mike King asked her to express her newfound faith in Jesus the Messiah. As your savior. Что для вас значит познать Христа как своего спасителя? Я знаю, что мы вырождены все в грехе. I know that I'm a sinner, that I was born in the sin, and um, I need uh, the, uh, the salvation from the sin. So I know the salvation will come with Jesus Christ. And the uh, I know that uh, I will uh, commit sins in future life, and Jesus will protect me from my sins. The testimony of this young woman greatly encouraged the team to continue preaching the word of God. But whether the Ukrainian people had prior knowledge of Christ or not, they humbly responded to public invitations given in different locations throughout the city. This woman greatly appreciated hearing the message that Christ cleanses from sin. Brother Binnick and the IBJM team were also able to take advantage of Ukrainian television. Here missionary Alan Lord shares his faith in Christ with the Ukrainian interviewer. The next morning the team left for Nipopetros and new opportunities to share Jesus Christ with other Ukrainian people. We're standing on the banks of the Dnieper River in the city of Dnipropetrovsk, where just a few minutes ago, eight believers were baptized. This is a city where there are many people who have become Christians in recent years since the fall of communism. And as you can see, they're joyful in their heart. They love the Lord Jesus Christ. And the thing that is so important for us to understand is that they take their Christianity serious. We see many believers today, even in America, who don't realize the great privilege it is to be a Christian. But these people believe what they believe. 
and they live their lives as they believe it. We're going to be going to the church and worshiping with them, and it's an exciting time for us to be here in the Ukraine. Radiant testimonies are abundant in the Ukraine. This happy woman just came from her baptism in the Dnieper River, and when asked about her salvation in Christ, she replied, Praise the Lord, everything is perfect. Um, I feel very easy. Uh, everything was beautiful. You f uh, the water was perfect and uh, everything is fine. You feel very li lightness in your heart. But what was it like to conduct believers' baptism under communism? This Russian pastor explains. We went at night somewhere out in the country, several pastors and several people who were to be baptized, and we baptized people at night secretly. And then in the morning we returned to the, uh, to the church and prayed. Nick, our translator, though only saved a year himself, here leads a fellow Ukrainian to faith in Jesus Christ. Next Sunday, I will come every Sunday at 10 o'clock in the morning to this church. Since today, in my soul, I will have Jesus Christ. Though under communist domination for 44 years, the Song of Songs never left the Church of Jesus Christ in the Ukraine. And the song was accompanied by a deep, abiding worship. Each day of ministry was unique and challenging. The next morning, the team visited the city square where Pastor Richard Watt talked about the attitude of the Ukrainian people in post-communist Nipopetrovsk. What we're finding is that many people are bitty, bitter against uh, communism and they're, they show their anger, but we've had some that were in the Communist Party that have been saved and people are hungry for the literature. We, we just can't hand it out fast enough. Uh, every time we preach on the street, we have many, many people make a profession of faith. The scripture says, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. With the beginning of each new day, the team stayed busy confronting the Ukrainian people with the gospel, passing out gospel tracts in the Ukrainian language, conducting personal one-on-one -on -one soul winning. As many responded to the message of the cross, the team was able to acquire their names and addresses this was New Testament style marketplace ministry in a nation that had been denied the gospel for over four decades. What a joy to watch God work and move among the Ukrainian people. I was told of a man who was looking for me. Some stranger of God.
One of the more remarkable and moving scenes of the entire trip was the baptism of this 73-year-old Jewish man who had previously been saved in his Ukrainian church. At this man's personal request, and after securing the permission of the church officials, Brother Benick baptized him in the waters of the Nipper River. Here in the open air, he boldly confesses Christ as Savior. What a glorious sight was this baptism, attended by his wife, Ukrainian Christians, and American team members. The air was frigid and cold, but this man's heart was warm and anxious to obey the scriptures. How fervent is his faith. Many were moved to tears as he came out of the water and kissed his wife. This day, he began his walk in newness of life. In the book of Acts, the apostles were often invited into the homes of the people. This same Jewish couple, rejoicing in their salvation, graciously invited the entire team to their Ukrainian dwelling where their warm hospitality eased the chill of the winter temperatures. The team enjoyed sweet fellowship together, delicious Ukrainian cooking, and a piano concert that impressed everyone with the abilities of these gifted people. That evening, another large gathering of Ukrainian people assembled in a large public auditorium for a special service. Because of the overflow crowd that had gathered, over 700 people waited for an hour and a half in the cold night air for a second service to begin. In these two services, lasting over three hours in length, the team had the opportunity to minister to over 1,400 people. As the service was in progress, Pastor Richard Watt interviewed a young Ukrainian named Yuri. This dedicated young man expressed his thankfulness to American Christians for caring about his nation, his city, and his soul. Beautiful singing was provided at each service as Brother Benning and several team members preached the Word of God. Every ear was a listening ear to the words of eternal life. Hundreds of salvation slips were distributed to those receiving Christ as Savior. Epopatros provided many exciting moments in reaching men and women for Christ. After several hours on the bus, the arrival in Kiev opened yet another door for ministry to the Ukrainian people. In the morning, several of the men conducted our final day of street meetings, again bringing the message of the gospel to yet another city of the Ukraine. As in the other cities, the Word of God was graciously received by the people of Kiev. We were also able to pick up a new shipment of Bibles for distribution in Kiev. The greatest gift from America is the Scriptures, and in every Ukrainian city we visited, this special gift was considered a treasure by those who received it. Everyone had a story to tell from this wonderful trip. From a bridge overlooking much of the city of Kiev, Two of our team members desired to share their impressions of all they had experienced during our visit to the Ukraine. Here missionary Ron Plott and Pastor Glenn Mormon give testimony of their experiences. One of the greatest moments I had was when this lady came up to me in the subway in Kharkov and she just could not believe that we would spend our own money to come here. And after I shared with her how uh, the Lord has given us the Word of God and the commandment to go into all the world, and that's why we're here to share with her the Word, she had tears in her eyes, and she thanked me so much from the bottom of her heart that we would come to share with her God's precious Word. We're in the city of Kiev in the Ukraine. I just talked to several military men from the United States that are over here meeting with the Soviet military. They asked what I was doing here. I said, well, I'm with a bunch of preachers that are sharing the good news about Jesus Christ to the people. They kind of smiled, looked at one another and said, well, how receptive are the folks? I said, unbelievably receptive. That amazed them. I said, we cannot hand out enough literature. It's a mob every time we open up uh, boxes that have Bibles or children's Bible stories or tracts. The people just cannot get enough literature. It truly is amazing to see the hunger of these precious people as they want so much to have a copy of the Word of God in their hands and something they can take home and read. You just have to experience it in order to be able to believe it. It's just so utterly amazing what God is doing here in this country among his, these people. The giving of Bibles and the distribution of gospel tracts is always a delight. But on a prior trip to the Ukraine in May of 1992, we had the honor of meeting Pastor Stefan and presenting a financial gift to help in the construction of his church facility. We were able to present a second financial gift to Pastor Stefan during this return visit. Brother Doug Brooks makes the happy presentation. The friends back at the U.S. had collected together uh, a sum of money 
uh, along with uh, those who came uh, this past week. And we have $642 plus 4,633 uh, coupons uh, to present to the work out in the Church of Boradaka that many others will be saved. I'd like to present that to you. In the evening, a final service was conducted in a large meeting room in the city. Many made decisions for Jesus Christ. The ministry in Kiev was a blessing to each team member and would hold a special place in our hearts as we began preparation for departure back to America. Layman Ed Jordan shared this testimony. Thank God for the privilege. It's been mine of coming here to the Ukraine and going around the country, seeing the country, and seeing souls come to know the Lord Jesus Christ as we've had services and as we passed out tracks across this land, and uh, many have come to know the Lord as their Savior, and I pray that they'll, uh, the Holy Spirit will work in their lives and that they'll be able to find a church where they can worship God and learn about God. But the complete story of the city of Kiev and the Ukraine can never be written until a cataclysmic event that occurred 51 years ago is revealed. On this closing day of ministry in the Ukraine, a very special lady was our guide at the site of one of the greatest atrocities in the history of the world, a tragic event that occurred during the Second World War. The history of the former Soviet Union is written not only in the Kremlin, in missiles and the hammer and sickle, but also in the blood of its people. One of the most gruesome chapters of that story is a place called Babiar. Here on September 29 and 30, 1941, most of the Jewish citizens of the city of Kiev met their violent deaths at the hands of the German army. After being told to bring their valuables and personal items, they were ordered to report to an obscure location on the outskirts of the city they thought for deportation back to Germany, but they were unaware of the real horrors of Hitler's regime, the eradication of the Jew from the earth. After being stripped naked and having all their valuables confiscated, they were forced marched to the edge of a ravine, and one by one, men, women, and children were shot in the back of the head until 33,000 of them lay dead or dying. After being shot, their bodies, many still alive, were kicked like animals into the ravine below. At this location during the war, it is estimated that as many as 200,000 people, Jews, Ukrainians, Russians, and soldiers, were slaughtered like cattle. Their bodies burned in an attempt to hide this despicable act from the world. This woman's grandmother and aunt were two of the victims of Babiar. She recalls that tragic September day. This place became a big cemetery. All my relatives, my blood, my grandmother, and my aunt, who was only 33, are here. The deplorable story of Babiar is a constant reminder to all of us of this generation of the terrible price that Jewish people have paid in suffering and persecution. But the Ukrainian Jew can be one. If we'll go and preach the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and of his great love for them. Henry, that's some of the most amazing footage I have ever seen. It burdens my heart. It makes me want to give, get involved. The pastor who's watching, the missionary, the Christian layperson, what can they do to help the International Board of Jewish Missions get the gospel to the Ukrainian Jew? Brother Randy, there's not a day that goes by that I don't receive in my office a letter from someone in the Ukraine that's responded from the, our ministry there that is saying, we need more material. We want Bible studies. We want uh, teaching materials. We need more material. More, more, more. We don't know what to do. We have been given this challenge by the people themselves to help them, to reach out to them. We need to be able to provide more Bibles. We've given out thousands of gospel tracts. We need to print thousands more, maybe even a million more. We need to be able to purchase this material and take it there and give it to them. They say that every Bible that's given produces at least one soul. 
we need to be able to provide perhaps even 100,000, a million more Bibles if it's possible. There's 260 million people that need material. We can get full Bibles for $2, New Testaments for 50 cents. If someone would give $1,000, we could buy 2,000 New Testaments. For $1,000, 500 complete Bibles. But we've got to do what we must do right now. 27,000 people saved in only 16 months. Uh, that's remarkable. So when I write a check, when I give a gift to your ministry to help get the Bibles, help get the Christian literature to these people, I'm going to see something in return for my dollar, correct? We take everything that is sent in and we put it right into the ministry. We purchase Bibles. We ship them over. We purchase literature. We print our own gospel tracts. And so everything that is given goes directly towards the purchase material. We need to take as much as we can, as fast as we can, for as long as we can, and as much as we can before this door closes. They say that the doors may close someday, but I'm more concerned about the minds of the people closing than I am the doors closing. Already in some of the cities, we're seeing westernization. We're seeing the cults come in by the thousands, 30,000 Mormons preparing to go to the Ukraine. And we've got to pick up this challenge and do what we can right now. Uh, Henry, we're talking about an urgent need, aren't we? This is something that has to be done right now, today. The cults are on the streets everywhere. The Mormons are present. The Jehovah Witnesses are present. The Baha'i religions, the Eastern European religions, the occult is coming in. We've got to do what we must do right now. In a year from now, it may be different. Two years, already things are changing, and so we've got to be prepared and ready. We can't let what happened here in America happen. I ask people in churches, do the Jehovah Witnesses visit your house? Almost everybody says, yes, they have. But yet, what are we doing? We're letting them steal the souls and damning them to hell. We've got to do it now. Anti-Semitism is on the rise throughout the world. How much time do we have? Can we afford another Babiar in modern history? Now is the time to reach the Ukrainian Jew. Will you help us financially? Are you burdened enough to sit down and write a check? $25, $50, $100, $500, as Henry said, $1,000 to print Bibles, Christian literature, in the Ukrainian language to reach these people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Would you write us right now? The address is on your screen. Show Henry Benick that you care, that you do want to get involved with winning the Ukrainian Jew to Christ. We need your help. We await your reply. Help us to go now, today. My friend, have you ever wondered what life is like without hope? Imagine waking up every day and wondering if you would eat that day, or if you would eat tomorrow, if you would even be alive tomorrow, if your country would suddenly go into revolution, or if your entire economy and the way of life you had known would crumble before your eyes. That's the way people live in much of the world. And yet we know that there is hope. There is hope in Jesus Christ. People in tens of thousands of cities in Europe and the Russian Ukraine are receiving hope right now because they are receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ. But friend, we must hurry. Thousands each week in the Ukraine are turning to false religion instead of Jesus Christ. 
Think with me for a moment. If you could go anywhere in the world and in just two weeks see 6,200 people saved, distribute 15,000 Bibles, place 350,000 gospel tracts in waiting hands, and distribute 30,000 flyers to eager hearts, would you go? Would you help someone else go? That's what happened recently to the ministry team of the International Board of Jewish Missions under the leadership of Henry Binnick and Dr. Orman Norwood. But these men need your help. We see the economy so bad now, and we're wondering, how long will this last? Now, all we know is what we're trying to do right now, and we're, we're determined to continue to come back and to do the work that we've done in the past. This time, I'm really privileged to have with me the president of IBJM, Dr. Orman Norwood. Dr. Norwood has been with IBJM for over 20 years, worked with Dr. Jacob Gardenhaus in many countries, but it was necessary, I felt, uh, for him to be here to see something that is totally different in the matter of winning Jewish people or others to Jesus Christ than ever before. And Dr. Norwood, let me just thank you for coming with me. I know that this is um, a little different than what you experienced in the past. Why don't you give us a little bit of your impression of what you've found already happening? Brother Benick, I have been amazed at the openness of the people, the willingness to respond to personal witness, the way that the literature is not wasted. A lot of times we invest in gospel literature. We pray that God will bless it and it will not be wasted. Uh, out of the thousands of tracts that we gave out last night in the square in Kiev, uh, I only found...